What is up, people of the internet? Welcome back to another episode of the Waveform Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Marquez. And I'm Andrew. And Tesla wants you to sit in a wet dumpster while your car charges. You're just going straight through? <laughs> yeah, why? Like, okay. Just uh, jumping right in. Well, just in case you're wondering what else we're going to talk about today, we are later going to talk about the Pixel 6a possibly having a higher refresh screen. And we're going to talk about how you might be seeing more ads on your Apple devices. But yes, yes, I have a lot of quick hits in here. And um, I guess you've picked which one you want to talk about. I just first. read the first bold text yes. in the doc. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have to talk about this. This is a, this is, I mean, it's a dumpster with Tesla written on the side of it. So they it actually is. did think this through a little bit. Um, apparently there are going to be, and I don't know where this is. I it's guess in Germany. Oh, so there's, there's one in Germany. No. Okay. There's one in Germany where, uh, you park to charge a supercharger and there's a pool next to the superchargers yes. and you can just hang out in the pool while you charge, which so many weird things about this. First of all, I always find it funny when you advertise things you can do that happen when you take a long time to charge, like the Ionic five. We just got done testing it and we're working on a video with it. It has a, a driver's seat that reclines all the way back and has a footrest to kick up. That's because why. Okay. if you are charging for an hour and a half on some random slow charger, you want to at least be comfortable. Okay. And so you can Fair. do that. Um, but ideally, you're only at a Tesla supercharger for like half an hour. Do you have time in half an hour to change, get into a bathing suit, swim around, change back, dry off, potentially shower, continue on your road trip? I guess, maybe. I, I, I'm i not totally sure. It seems like a stretch. Um, it's just to describe this a little bit for audio listeners too, it's like it is a dumpster, not quite the one you'd find like behind a McDonald's or, or like outside of a building that you throw trash in. It's more of the one you would get if you were like cleaning out your house or like doing a renovation that you would rent and it would come on the back of a truck. So you're saying like a nice dumpster, like a kind of decent. In lesser words, I guess that's what, sure. what I'm saying, but not exactly my sentiment. It, it, it is funny though. It's a, it's painted. It says Tesla on the side. It is both over and under engineered if we're considering this a pool. It looks like it has stairs into it. It looks like it has a pool wow. cover, but it also just has like cones and caution tape around it and like a hose just dangling in with water. Um, so yeah, if you want to cool off, it says it's up to four people. I think you could probably fit more in there, but um, you know, <laughs> that's really funny. Maybe maybe there's some safety issues with it if you go more than four. It also looks like it's just gone like a construction lot. Like there's like temporary stairs behind it. It looks fine empty. But if I came up to the supercharger and plugged in and I looked over behind the chargers and there was like three people in a dumpster, I wouldn't like even think about out. getting into that dumpster with people. <laughs> but then again, what other chargers can you swim around? Fair, that? fair. They're revolutionizing the game. Um, I, I like also the, the article had just a couple of really funny lines. I'm just going to throw one out there that was too golden not to talk about Um Quote, apparently it's meant for four occupants, assuming there are four people who fit the cross-section of wealthy enough to own a Tesla and likes to sit in wet dumpsters. It's just called it dumpsters. Brilliant. Man. It's fantastic. My next quick hit here I have is, um, remember the Polestar 02, their like roadster concept? This is the one we talked about when we first saw the video of the drone flying off the yes, back of the Polestar yes. concept. Okay, yes, I remember this. Yeah, what do you, uh, like, I feel like what I mostly remember about it is the drone and just that like, I really digged how it looked. I thought it looked really sharp. Yeah, the, the aesthetic of the Polestar is definitely the, the thing that was most notable to me. I love yes. the thing. It looks amazing. Um, the specs, I think we are actually getting a little bit more information on. So I, I do have 3.2 seconds, 0 to 60. So 3. clearly, 2. if like we want to immediately compare this to the Roadster, slower. Right. Well, yeah, Tesla Roadster. I don't know. Yeah. We don't. There's no price, right? for this not that i know of um the main thing i wanted to talk about here is and the reason it's in the news is because it says they set a release date for 2026 which i found really interesting i don't think we've had something that's had like that far out of the uh, is it safe to say in the ev world we're way more used to seeing a within one year release date and seeing that being delayed rather than like right. giving themselves the buffer yeah we get the promise of one thing yeah and it's usually like two, three years away. Like I'm seeing some 2024 promises, maybe 2025 as far as individual models. Mm -hmm. And then we have companies going, we'll have some electric stuff by 2030 and you don't really know what it is. But as far as this car that you can see here, not coming for another four years, that's kind of a while, but maybe under promise over deliver is, is their way to go. I would like Polestar. to think that I have one other, and it could be both one other theory on this. And is it potentially just, we had a really, really good 
first uh, news release, and like it did really well. Like our our clip of it did awesome. People were really interested in yeah, it. Yeah, it's interesting. Is it like oh this died down a little bit? You know, it's a while away, but let's throw a release date out there. Let's get in the news cycle again. It it kind of almost reminds me, while still way too far away, of like the uh, the Apple purple iPhone, like another another shot in the press in the news cycle or like a new one plus color news cycle refresh yeah you know my read on this yeah my read on this is they made the concept video and never had any intention of making the car but it was received so well that they said you know what let's try to make it and so they're going to need a couple years of r d to actually get started with this and now they're going to try to make one i like that um i have two questions for you pure speculation questions sure. um one do you think it has the drone attached to it? Uh, or give me a percentage of how likely is it to have the drone? So there's 0% chance it works exactly how we saw it in the video. But okay. but will they like find a way to build a drone into the car maybe? I'd give that a 30% chance. I was going to go 20. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I have pretty low expectations for that. Um Next question. Do you think this comes out before the Tesla Roadster? Or which do you think comes out first? Uh, wow. Well, the, the Roadster was announced in 2017. I think the Tesla Roadster comes out before this. I agree. Because Tesla's theoretically further along in R&D, <laughs> I mm-hmm. think, maybe. And I also have a lot of people's money. And so maybe there's <laughs> theoretically some lawsuits that could start to creep up if they don't deliver a car. Like it's been now, what has it been? Five years since they took the money promising something in 2020? Mm-hmm. You know, someone's eventually going to get mad enough to say something, right? So yeah, maybe a little bit of extra pressure to Tesla. I, I think that's funny. So like my thought on this was, I did think, I do think Tesla Roadster comes out first, but if it doesn't, that means it will be going on close to 10 years since they've taken payments. Well, yeah, if they, if they go if all the way this, to 2026, yeah, yeah that, that's, I've never seen anything like that in the car world. I mean, there's crazy stuff in the exotic world where it's like, yeah, I ordered the Koenigsegg Gemera when I just saw like one working prototype and I gave Koenigsegg a million dollars and I'll get the car in a decade, but uh, that's a million dollars. That's for a different yeah. type of human where there's this weird, like Tesla Roadster cult that's like, when's this car coming out? It's got to come out soon, right? We don't know. Yeah, no, we'll see. But I do like the Polestar idea. I, I'm excited for it. I love the look of this. I, I, I like really sharp lines. So I really like the, the like Polestar boxy. Is all sharp Pol- lines. It's really nice. Um, Polestar is nice. We'll see. I do like that. It's also like, it is Polestar who has some cars out already. Like this is not a total. I could see like one of these totally random companies we've warned people about saying 2026. And I feel, I don't think that's interesting as a headline, but this is like a car company that's making cars already giving a four to five year time, yeah. which is interesting. It's like, what's the craziest thing about making this car? Like it's a convertible two-door EV, which we haven't seen any, correct me if I'm wrong, we haven't seen any convertible EVs with long range, right? All of the like decently long range EVs are very aerodynamic and not convertible. If there's one, it's like a very specific one, and you know it's not one of the main ones we talk about all the time. Yeah, I'm sure there's always someone who so finds some. Yeah, so I mean, there's a couple two door EVs out there. It's not that crazy to decide to make a 3.2 second zero to 60 EV in four years. You could make that today. Yeah. So I, you know, I don't think this is the craziest promise ever. I think the Roadster is such a crazy promise that people are just like, yeah, it's never happening. So I wouldn't be shocked if if Polestar over delivers on this one. Hopefully. But we'll see. Fingers yeah, crossed. A convertible. I've never seen a long range EV convertible, and I'm very curious what type of what type of stuff that does to your range. Can't be that good. Can't be good. I haven't thought of that. I'll be yeah. excited to see it. Um see. and quickly, last hit of the day of this episode is um of course it's EV related again, but we had a tweet this morning about so it seems like the Tesla app accidentally pushed forward a new tab about Tesla memberships and then took it back. So we're going to, everyone's assuming this is potentially memberships for non Tesla EV supercharging network. Yeah. Which has been rumored. And, and I've seen probably at least once a month, someone going, it's happening. Mm -hmm. They're going to open up superchargers for non Tesla's. And then it's just quiet yeah. and it doesn't happen. I'm like, what are you talking about? I have a non-Tesla EV. I'm waiting for it to be real. Let's see it. Uh, so yeah, when I finally saw it, we saw another tweet this morning. Yeah. Breaking, 
Tesla has announced this membership program. I'm like, sure, I I hope so. And then I, I look in my app and it's not there. And I'm like, I don't yes. believe you. But it turned out uh, this was potentially an accidental publish, maybe with a typo in it. Mm-hmm. So what we observed was a screenshot that showed two tiers. One, pay per use. So pay as you go supercharging. You get access to the supercharger network. Or two, membership. 99 cents per month. And you secure lower price per kilowatt hour. Mm-hmm. Now, 99 cents a month sounds amazing. And yes. when this disappeared from the app like an hour later, we suspected that might have been a typo that they need to fix. Yes. <laughs> it might be might supposed to be nine ninety nine a month. Yeah. So let's start with um we're I think the main assumption and for most people here is just that this is like we said, for non Tesla EVs being able to use the supercharging network. And the reason we kind of think that is we're already seeing that in Europe. That is a thing in Europe already. And because Tesla applied for funding from the government to expand the supercharging network. And to do that, their network has to be available to more than one manufacturer. Which so it's hilarious that it just says more than one. Yeah, that's what I, the one article I was reading from like Electric said it has to be open to more than one manufacturer. So, so there's also two or more. Yeah. I, I mean, assuming that's going to mean everyone because that should mean CS, CCS. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but so that's what we think is going to happen. The 99 cents a month. A lot of people think is a placeholder. Um, in comparison to rates in Europe, it's approximately twelve dollars USD a month. So like yeah. nine ninety nine sounds much more reasonable there, or anything ninety nine per month. Uh, like I think I don't think ninety nine cents a month yeah. is going to be that. Um, but other than that, there's I saw one other theory that this might be, and that is that this actually isn't even for non Tesla EVs that. Because nowhere on the page does it say that, right? That's true. It says membership. Mm -hmm. This could potentially just be a membership for Tesla owners for using the supercharging network and Mm -hmm. maybe could combat the um, like rising price of electricity in the future by getting lower lower price per kilowatt hour. Yeah, and that is also very possible, and I think it could be interesting to see. Basically, you're going to have to do a calculus of like how many supercharger miles do you drive to see if it's worth it for you or not. Me, personally... Lately, I only use superchargers when I do road trips. And if I look at my charging history for the past like eight months, that's like January of this year, I've only done like one road trip where I use a supercharger. Mm. So I would definitely not pay $9.99 a month for the membership. I would do pay as you go. Mm-hmm. But if I was somebody who does like a, like I don't have one in my garage and I rely on a local supercharger all the time or I do tons of road trips or something like that, yeah, I would pay $9.99 a month and secure that lower rate. Probably seems like you'd save the 10 bucks with the lower rate. But again, that's the math you got to do. But yeah, that'll that'll just have to come back later when they fix whatever they need to fix because it's gone and yeah. it might as well not exist right now. And We'll figure it out when they eventually set it live again. Yeah, I think overall, if this is for, I mean, like we're, we've mentioned a hundred times, we're all very open and eager for this to be available for other EVs. Yep. Um, the only con I see coming to this potentially is if you're a Tesla owner and you already are living in an area where superchargings can get pretty like crowded, now you're going to add more cars to that. That's and like a, you might have a longer wait time. That's a thousand percent my only concern. We have a, I've probably mentioned this before. We have chargers here at the building yeah. that we're at. And there are lots of Teslas around people who use the space in this building. But there's also like Nissan Leafs and there's also Chevy Bolts. And there's also a bunch of plug-in hybrids. Yeah. And for some reason, it's always the plug-in hybrids that are plugged in in the front of the building. Yeah. When those are the ones that, need it the least, theoretically. If you're a battery EV, obviously you can't like just drive away and like, you know, if you have no battery, uh-huh. you have no battery. But it always seems to be the plug-in hybrids that get the spots in the morning. So I wonder like if they, the superchargers open up, like people who are already getting the superchargers that are like full or like typically have a short wait, does that turn into a really long wait? Because now every EV and maybe even some plug-in hybrids are taking the spots. Don't know yet. Hopefully yeah. not too I- crazy. I feel like I wouldn't see as many plug-in hybrids in so a supercharging network feels more like a like gas station to me where that's somewhere in between your trip whereas like yeah. at the building here you may have bought a plug-in EV and you commute close enough to where you're trying not to ever touch gas right, right. so like you're trying to get that 
20 miles each yeah, way. Yeah, you're parked all time. day. You yeah. just plug it in in the morning. And then when you leave at 5 p.m., you unplug it. Yeah, and you just never not. touch your gas. And your gas is yeah. for those longer trips. So maybe yeah. that wouldn't. I also, one more disclaimer before we go to trivia. Um, Just in case this wasn't obvious, I, I did see a lot of people on Twitter seeing the like 99 cents or the 9.99 and thinking that's really cheap. But that's just for access. You're still paying for the electricity that you use for that charge. Yeah, just at a somewhat lower rate. We don't know how much yes. lower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much it. We'll probably talk about this eventually again in the future when it sorts itself out. <laughs> I think the next time this is like this is way closer because we actually saw it in the app. But I'm, I'm pretty sure the next time we talk about this will be the actual launch. We'll try not yeah. to give this the news cycle every single time it gets yeah. mentioned because our whiteboard just uh, erased to zero on days since this was announced. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, trivia. Yeah, let's, let's get, get into it trivia. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another week of trivia. Uh, I decided to tone it down a little bit this oh. week. I, um, but I, I'm pretty excited for this first question because it's something we talk about in the office okay. a fair amount. So question number one for this week is, put the following products in chronological order, the order they came out. Google Pay, Google Wallet, oh, no. and Android Pay. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Yeah, fun. Yeah. Yeah. Is it fine if I have follow-up questions? Sure. Like, because I will. Oh, I yeah. will. Yeah, we can get into it. Get okay. in the weeds. Perfect. I'll have those when we get into trivia answers later. Until then, let's take a break. <music> this episode of Waveform is brought to you by Indeed. We love trivia here at Waveform, as you probably already know, and we want you, the listeners, to join in into the fun. Andrew, hit me with a question. All right. So you've probably got hundreds of gigabytes in your pocket right now, but can you tell me when the first one gigabyte disk drive was released? I'll give you multiple choice here. Don't worry. Okay. You and the listeners have multiple choice. Yep. A, 1970, B, 1980, or C, 1990, the, the year of my birth. So obviously the most important one. Which one is it? 1980. So if you chose 1980, then you know your refrigerator sized disk drives and you can flex your smarts. And with Indeed, you can have candidates showcase their smarts before the interview even begins. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. So their powerful tools such as Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews help you find great talent and save hours of research time. Plus, when you use Indeed, you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. So start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed dot com slash waveform right now claim your 75 dollar credit at indeed.com slash waveform that's indeed.com slash waveform terms and conditions apply offer good for a limited time need to hire you need indeed all right welcome back i have uh, a mark herman article here because we always love mark herman articles um about apple potentially increasing the ads that we're seeing in their software from like you know ios ipad os mac and everything um, which I thought was kind of interesting because we all know Apple as being this company and they have some really, really good privacy restrictions, including, um, what's it called where you have to allow, you can ask apps not to track you. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. they, they have the Apple like tracking program or whatever for different apps to not be able to sell ads based on all your information. Yeah. Interestingly enough, recently there was a earnings call where during that earnings call, Tim Cook specifically mentions out their ads department. And um, outside of that, the vice president of their ads department said that they want to essentially increase revenue from ads. They basically, they took a hit pretty hard during COVID and they want, they were right now creating about $4 billion in revenue, but they said they want to hit double digits oh, of that. Poor Apple. Only yeah, poor, only exactly. Four billion. Right now, the main ads we're seeing on Apple devices are um, the news app and the stock app has just kind of like regular ads you would expect to see in almost any article-based website. Um, mm -hmm. And then like inside the app store, you have the like recommended apps when you're searching something. You can pay okay. for ad placement up there, right? Um, which at this point already seems like kind of a, uh, you're paying for like a thousand dollar phone. And now it's a little weirder when the stock news app and the stock stocks app and your yeah, stock. Yeah, I guess that is the funny part about like 
the iPhone experience, which is like some people bought a thousand dollar phone, some people bought a four hundred dollar phone. They're all getting the exact same software experience, though. So yes, it, it will affect people who spent fifteen hundred dollars on a phone. Yeah, um, and so that's kind of where we're seeing most of this right now. I also do you pay for News Plus? I recently unsubscribed. You recently unsubscribed. Yeah. Did Did you notice you were still getting ads in that? In the, the subscription-based model? I unsubscribed because I wasn't using it, so okay. I didn't notice too much, but I believe you. I would like someone to confirm that for me, but f- according to the article, there are still ads in the $10 per month That's news sad. thing, but it is fewer than if you weren't paying. Mm, yeah, Which, so the thing about, yeah. I mean, I pay, what is it, twelve ninety nine a month for YouTube Premium, and there are zero ads, mm-hmm. and I'd like to keep it that way. So to pay 10 bucks a month for Apple News... And you still get ads, but it's just a little bit less. That kind of, I kind of just want to pay for zero ads. But Apple wants to make money from ads. Exactly. So. And I, I agree with you. I think all I think almost all platforms should be like that. Like I think yeah. a lot of people say Twitter Blue paying five five bucks a month should eliminate ads from zero Twitter. ads. Like that makes them it, I think more people would do Twitter Blue just for that than all the other garbage that they're suggesting in Twitter Blue. Having a payment tier for slightly less ads but not zero ads seems like you have too many ads. That's like a thing that shouldn't need to exist. It either has you pay for zero ads or you don't pay and we support this free content with advertising. But if you have so many ads that people would pay just to have less ads but still have some ads, that seems kind of excessive. Yeah. Um, It's... yeah, I would rather there be just be zero ads. We are seeing more and more of that, um, like Hulu and stuff like that. We have mentioned it before, how Netflix might be going a tier down. And and like I kind of understand it. I understand maybe you want to pay less per month and have some ads. Um, it does start getting tricky on where that's going to go, whether that's going to start leaching into the, like, the full-blown payment tiers of stuff like that. But $10 a month for a news app, I probably shouldn't get any ads in it. Yeah. I would think um, this is the most. This is also the most like public company thing I've ever heard. Where it's like, we were only making four billion dollars a year on ads, and the only way to satisfy our shareholders is to turn that number up. So here we go. And they want to hit <laughs> more d- dollars, double digits. That would mean over double, two point five times 2.5 what they're X. doing right now, um, which is a lot. So um, expect to see more ads through your Apple products. Um, I think the one, so in Mark Gurman's article, and we'll link it in the show notes because it has like far, all the information you could ever want in it and all the speculation. Yeah. But the main speculation I saw was that we would potentially be seeing it in Apple Maps, similar to like how like, Yelp right now, do you, like you know how Yelp is. Or Google Maps. Or Google Maps, yeah, pretty much. Like you think you're getting the right recommend, the perfect recommendations for everything, but you can pay for slots to get into more highly recognizable areas of that. Yelp has been that for a long time. As long as they're crystal clear about which ones are ads, because I always know when I'm searching on Google Maps, like if you're in a, if you're new to an area and you search, you know, sushi and you, you pull up the search results and you see that the first three are all ads, I automatically skip those and just go to the top rated ones underneath the ads. So I, I hope that in Apple Maps, if you're searching for things, you have a very clear distinction of what is an ad and what isn't, because Apple Maps is a free service. Yes. So that I think I'm fine with. I think it's 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 clear to us. I think it's obvious that it's not clear to everyone because of other places we're seeing that happen in, like Yelp, like Google, just regular search. How many people, like you and I understand that those first three results every single time oh. are going to be... Re- quote unquote, like recommended or ad or paid for a space. Right. But the majority of people using stuff like this really? have no idea, I think. Dang. I, I mean, I've seen family members click those all the time and it. And they don't know that they're ads? They don't know they're ads. If I get something where the ad is also the first search product or the first search result under that that I want, I'll make sure I click the bottom Same. search result because like Same. it infuriates me. I'm not trying to reward the ads. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. Well, yeah. No, I can see. I mean, this is the funny thing. When Apple started putting like iCloud ads inside of the settings in the iPhone, you knew that they were pretty serious about subscription revenue and recurring revenue. And that's obviously a shift that they're deciding to make as a company to just bring Mm -hmm. the numbers up and make a lot of money. Great. 
Um, so yeah, now that they've opened that faucet a little bit, they realize, oh yeah, subscription revenue and, and dollars from advertising are a pretty good hand in hand combo. Let's just open that faucet completely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this doesn't surprise me as much as it's going to annoy me. It, exactly. <laughs> um, I, and like in terms of, if you're thinking of almost tripling your revenue on that, only adding it to Apple maps, like where do you think you could see it somewhere else inside the phone? Like we've had samsung in the past and we've criticized them relentlessly for this because they deserve it where you're getting in your notification bar like yeah ads for up there were ads to upgrade your phone to the for people using the brand new 1800 dollars like fold three yeah. when they first in the first month it would be if it would feel like such a premium phone and you're like wow the performance is so much better and this screen is gorgeous and look how much they redid the software everything looks great and then you get a little pop down banner ad that's like get a new galaxy 20% yeah. off and you're like what this is what is this this doesn't belong here such an odd uh what's the word when two things are uh an odd juxtaposition juxtaposition it's an odd juxtaposition of it things is. yeah um I, it's yeah I, I agree with that these premium phones it feels really strange on and i feel like at a certain point it shouldn't be there they're clearly going to want to make more revenue i think that's obvious to everyone and that's not just an apple thing that's everybody like we said samsung doesn't as well do you think there's any chance so we've shown off phones in the past like infinix where you are getting an extremely budget phone and you are getting that because of the fact that there are ads on the phone. Now, those are third-party ads. Those aren't first-party, mm -hmm. um, which I guess Apple is still technically serving third... It's third-party people paying Apple to be an Apple ad, which yeah. is, uh, I guess, still third-party considered. Um, do you think we could ever see a reduction in price on any Apple phones as an ad version versus a no-ad version? No. Nah. No. Do you think we could see that in any other phone company that's larger than Infinix, say Samsung, say Google, something like that? A cheap ad-supported phone? Cheaper um, ad-supported phone. Same I could, phone. I could see that as a way for some of the lowest price ones to like find a way to break through to a new audience. Like you remember the Amazon Fire phone where they had no. a – I'm pretty sure the Amazon phone came out where they had one price for just buying the phone – and they also had a lower price for, I mean, this is like Kindle, like an ads, and you you yes. expect there to be ads in the software, but the phone's cheaper and you know that that's what you're going to deal with. Uh, I wouldn't really expect anybody paying more than a few hundred dollars to ever want to deal with that and saving a few bucks doesn't seem worth it. But it depends on what becomes the norm because, again, this is Apple we're talking about and a lot of the bigger companies, when they decide to do something, it just becomes like normal very quickly yes. and then a lot of people just start to accept it in other phones and it could happen that way but hopefully not i think that's what this whole article scares me about a little bit is the more we're seeing apple do this and we've already seen samsung do it i just want to make sure that this is like not just an apple thing we're saying they're doing but like yeah i'm worried about the more and more this is going to start popping up into phones and the more and more i'm going to feel like i'm watching cable television when i'm on my phone my notification bar is not safe my just, google maps isn't safe my default apps yeah. aren't safe this i think this is one of the biggest reasons why i've not gamed very much on my phone is because so many games are just full of ads and they they almost require you i was playing a, a racing game where it's just like hey I was just playing the game for a while for just like half an hour of just like going through races and like winning, losing some, upgrading the car, blah, blah, blah. And then at a certain point, it's like you ran out of gasoline. Like you can't even play the game anymore unless nice. you like pay for gas. And it was like, would you like to pay for gas with tokens or by watching an ad? I was like, I just, I already bought the game. Like, let me Oh, just you play. bought the game and it had Yeah. It? And it oh. was just, it was like you ran out of gasoline. You need a, you need some version of getting more gas. I think this is CSR racing or something like that for, for those who also play. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we mostly have Clash of Clans to thank for stuff like this. I hate um, it. Because they've, they were one of the mobile games that really like brought microtransactions. And I, my biggest issue with microtransactions is I always prefer the model where it is a free to play game that includes microtransactions that don't give you anything extra in the game they just give yeah. you aesthetic properties whereas then there's like pay clash of clans pay to win type of game pay to win or yeah. even just like pay to advance like you should be on the same playing field no matter what and then like you see riot is a perfect example they're one of the biggest video game companies out there and their two main games are free to play with only aesthetic benefits mm -hmm. and i spent way too much money on both of those games just because you want the aesthetics 
unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I just looked it up. CSR racing is free. So this is, okay. it is definitely more along the lines of pay to play and also a little bit of pay to accelerate how good you get at it because okay. it's just literally modifying a car. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. The world of advertising is is obviously very complicated. It's how our business works, but it's how a lot of businesses work too. Yeah, so it's hard for us to throw stones yeah. when no, you know, yeah. we have that. Not casting stones, just like, hey, I if you that's I think that's what it comes down to is our videos are free and ad supported. But if you pay for a product like a phone and then continue to get more ads, it feels a little worse. Yeah. I think the thing that's really throwing me is the fact that it's like a it's a default app that comes on the phone that is then you have and, built in. And also like there is a little bit of a weird aspect of that. Like Apple has done the program where you can eliminate being able to get tracked and get sold ads where a lot of companies, big and small, have claimed revenue loss because of that. Well, you'll still get ads. They'll just be worse. They're worse, but that also means they, the companies selling those ads are getting far, far less money. So it's mm-hmm. putting a big hit onto them, and then Apple's swooping in now and saying, like, well, we got we got that. Let's yeah. take that ourselves. Um, which I guess if you're the one controlling it, good for you. They're they're really taking over everything though in their ecosystem. They're gonna make so much money. It's gonna be wild. How long do you think before they hit that that goal? Let's say they just add it to maps and they'll also start making some more with like Apple TV Plus and stuff like that. Cause they just recently started it with um Major League Baseball. They're now running the ads on on that. I believe. Yeah, they'll do it in a year and a half. I think they'll get there. Wow. <laughs> I think they'll get their their ten trillion bazillion dollars that they need. Um yeah, no, we'll see though. We'll see. I'm looking forward to, so iPhones 14, 14 Max, 14 Pro, 14 Pro Max, they're all coming out, assuming in about a month, basically. We're actually pretty close. We're getting really close It's already to it. August, August, mid-August right now, so we expect those in mid-September. So that keynote might be pretty revealing about some of the new services. That's a really good as well. point. How do you think they could potentially, like, you know, Apple's not going to come out at the keynote and being like, we're increasing your ads. It's going to be like, oh no, we're yeah. personalizing recommendations in your default apps. How will they spin it? You're saying, yeah, yeah. How, always... What's the spin going to be? Mm, it's I mean, fantastic. Yeah, they'll they'll find a way to say like, we're going to find new ways to recommend you apps and games you've never heard of and seen before. And also, this isn't even like when they're at WWDC and they're talking to developers. Developers specifically are people who want their apps and games to be seen by more people and they want to make more money from their apps and games. Uh, so in a keynote for WWDC, they could be a little bit more direct. Yeah. About like, we want to help you reach new audiences and increase revenue. But uh, the iPhone keynote is just talking to everyone buying an iPhone. That's, they would never say that. They would want to say yeah. something very positive and spinny and I'm sure they're already writing it. Allegedly, it's already in production. I think that's, Probably not a surprise. Uh, production, the keynote for the, is in for production? the keynote video, which I guess is so they're doing some in person events and they're doing some. Uh, I, I guess I went to one in person event, WWDC, but it was a recording and we all went to yeah. the event to watch the recording. Mm-hmm. So they're still doing this big recording and then playing it back on stage. I don't know what the September event's going to be. It might be the same thing. Uh, but yeah, who knows? Allegedly, they're they're recording something now. Do you know where you heard that from? That's I've never thought about how far in advance they do it. I think Twitter somewhere. I wish I remember. I'm I surprised didn't save the tweet. We don't see more leaks from the early productions of live stuff oh, like that. I'm sure that is the most tightly guarded production ever because yeah. Apple has their own internal production. But we're also not seeing it from like when Samsung's been doing it either. Or I guess they're doing more live. No, they're yeah. still doing recorded. They're doing they recorded stuff. But they recorded like indoors, like nobody has to see them outside. Like if they tried to do something like in Times Square, like here's the new Samsung Galaxy, somebody would record it from the street. Yeah. But this is all like super inside protected stuff. So it never leaks. The presentation never leaks and the products already never leak. That's not true. Ask Google. But like the the presentations. Like all these secretly guarded products get like leaked all the time but those get leaked outside of them like recording videos those get leaked in other parts of the supply chain Mm -hmm. on their way to the stores on their way to the whatever getting tested but the actual presentation which is curiously probably the stuff that i'm most interested in seeing i want to see the behind the scenes i really want to see behind the scenes i want to see the edit bay 
like where they edit those things, where they're putting together all those graphics and those transitions, which have like a combination of like 3D and practical and like the the tours around Apple campus through yeah. drone shots. Does, How much of that is a drone? Does Media Arts Lab make the Apple keynote films? Do you think they have them do that? Or do you think that's like just their ad campaigns? I think, well, that's a good question. It could just all, I imagine it's all internal Apple teams. Right. And they have their own production team who is probably m working on all that stuff. Right. But okay. I, I don't think they'll ever tell us or tell me. I think they would tell you and they would tell anyone well, else. Well, the thing is, is we will never be able to see that because of all the like embargoed stuff that is in the production. So yeah. like while they would potentially be willing to like invite somebody to actually see how it's made behind the scenes, it's giving up way too much information way too early. So that will never happen. Well, what if they let us record, like show the behind the scenes process of making one of those keynotes, but then everything is embargoed until the keynote. That Listen, would be, that would be amazing. It would be incredible. And if you're listening, Apple, we would love to do that. That would actually be the sickest behind the I, scenes ever. I feel like with Apple, we find out information from them the latest out of everybody, and they still might not want you to even know any information that's being said. But like, said do you really end. want to see the behind the scenes of like, you saw the Samsung presentation. Oh, no, no, I don't care at all. Like, <laughs> it's not as good. No, I want to exactly. see the, the amazing production that they put together. I want to see how they make that. I think they're just worried about the information that's in that production. I mean, we're embargoes are pretty, pretty good. Somebody would do it eventually. Hopefully. They'll soften up a little bit. We'll soften them up a little bit. Give a little behind the scenes. Uh, maybe someday. Anyway, we got to take a break. <laughs> we'll talk about the Pixel 6a in a second and also Android 13. But until then, trivia time. All right, this trivia question is dedicated to all the garden staters in the audience. Mm. Reconstituted discs of New Jersey breakfast pork are commonly and correctly referred to as... You want to fight? I think we're going to disagree on this one. <laughs> I think we've called it different things. I mean, we'll we'll explain later. Yeah, we'll get there. Later at the trivia answers. We'll get yeah. there. All right, be right back. <laughs> this episode of Way Farm is brought to you by Wealthfront. So there's so much going on in our economy right now that can make your head spin. What's more frustrating is the fact that it seems like there's no solution in sight. All I know is you want your money to be safe. And so Wealthfront wants to provide you with a sense of security. So Wealthfront is an app that helps you save and invest your money. So right now you can earn 2% APY with a Wealthfront cash account. That's about 20 times more than if you left your money in a typical savings account in the bank right now. And getting a cash account is easy. It just takes a few minutes to sign up. And once you're signed up, you can immediately start earning 2% interest on your savings. Plus, if you open an account today, you'll get an extra $50 bonus with a deposit of $500 or more. There are nearly half a million people using Wealthfront to save more, earn more, and build long-term wealth. So why wait? Earn your 2% on your cash today. Visit wealthfront.com slash wave to get started. That's wealthfront.com slash wave. This high interest good news has been a paid endorsement from Wealthfront. All right, welcome back. Let's talk about Android 13 on the Pixel 6. This was, uh, so far, a pleasant surprise. Okay. So, actually, this sort of developed for a while. So, David and I were keeping an eye on the Android 13 betas. Um, we always look at the newest versions of iOS and Android when they come out and sort of put together a top features list as they get, like, developed as they go through beta. iOS 1, that happened already. Android came out in beta there wasn't really enough new stuff in the first beta to mm -hmm. do a video on the new features so we waited and then another beta came out and there wasn't really new stuff there so we kept waiting then another beta came out and there wasn't really enough new stuff there and then it just dropped early aosp before the pixel 7 usually you have to wait till the new phone to get yeah. like the stable new version of android um this week we just got android 13 now you'll only get it on a couple pixels the newest phones uh, I flashed it on my Pixel 6 Pro. Flashing, it does wipe the phone, so maybe there's a little extra benefit to me wiping my phone and setting it up from scratch. True. But I have now been using Android 13 on the Pixel 6 Pro for a solid 24 hours, and it's been very good. That's usually how it starts for me. It usually starts mm -hmm. very good. <laughs> but I did a video on the new features, uh, and there is some pretty cool stuff. 
definitely watch the video. I think one of the most interesting ones is apparently this is one of the most requested features of Android for the past couple of years, which is app specific languages. So yes. if you are bilingual, if you speak two languages, but maybe you only use one language in a certain app, one or two apps that you use, maybe it's like WhatsApp or like a you have a family group chat in another yeah. app or something like that. That's just another language over there. And you don't want to have to change the entire system language to, to properly use the app and the keyboard in that app. You can now go into the system settings and switch over just one app to a different language. And it will change everything about the app to the new language. And you can just work in one language in a certain app. That's pretty sick. Um, there's a bunch of other little features like that all sprinkled throughout Android 13. Um, I think most of the changes are bug fixes. Like it feels like Android 12.1 or okay. 12.2 to me, which is fine. That's, that it kind of sounds feels like fantastic. Yeah. Me. It's what Android 12, like yeah. would have been nice if it was when it came out a little more stable, a little less bugs. It's been smooth for me. No problems. Uh, but again, I'm gonna have to keep my eye on it cause you know, this is how pixels usually start out for me, but it's really good. There are uh, way more wallpaper customization settings. There's like 16 different color options now. My disappointment on the okay. home screen is to see the themed icons thing. I've seen a lot of Twitter posts about this. So when that first came out, it was just Google Apps. So if you check that box, it themes all of your Google Apps on your home screen to be like monochromatic to match your custom colors. Mm -hmm. And in this new version of Android 13, it was supposed to be able to theme like everything. I checked the box, it definitely doesn't theme everything. That's a lofty goal. Yeah, so it's still, like, and I have, I have some pretty common apps, Spotify, Instagram, they don't theme those. Like, there's a lot of apps that don't get themed. That's what I found really interesting. I think uh, Daniel Bader posted a picture of his home screen, and looking at it, it one, it looks terrible, because, like, he had maybe 12 apps on his home screen, and probably four of them weren't matching with the rest of them. But yeah. it seems like the four that weren't matching were, re like you said, Spotify, but then he had some other apps that I'd never heard of before. So it's right. really weird that the the super general ones aren't getting skinned where the some like totally w small scale programs I've never heard of. Are. It is truly a head scratching combination. Like a lot of the Google apps, not all of the Google apps, but most, oh, if not all, of the Google apps are all, like, skinned. Like, YouTube, Google Drive, Photos, yeah. all that stuff. But, like, Google Wallet isn't skinned for some reason. And then Instagram and Spotify aren't skinned. But you know what is? Uh, Relay Pro. <laughs> really? And, like, a the, couple like, third-party Reddit app? Yeah. That one's skinned for some reason. And Pocket Cast, my, po my podcast app, like that, it doesn't really make a lot of sense which ones are versus aren't skinned. And so my biggest problem with that is unless you happen to have a home screen that only uses skinned apps, it feels like I would never turn that on if it weren't yep. all of them on yep. my home screen because it would look so bad. I was really looking forward to being able to flip the switch and just have like a nice clean monochrome home yeah. screen. But the dream is dead. It doesn't yeah. work. I um, mean, but yeah, the you know Android 13 looks good. A lot of smooth stuff, a lot of good features in here. Uh, worth checking out the video yeah. on my top five. I'm very interested, mostly in the fact that you said it feels like a lot of bug fixes because I am still using my Pixel 6. I am increasingly still having more and more bugs. Um, I think I've mentioned a lot of them. You have the the. I have a screenshot here that I just showed you a second ago, but it is like yeah, it is hilarious to me. I, I think I've mentioned before how my search bar on my home screen will, despite always being forced dark mode on my phone, every once in a while, and happening probably two or three times a week now, will turn to light mode. Um, and I've said, it's just annoying. It's mostly an issue when I'm trying in the dark, and now I get a white screen. Yeah. Um, so it happened to me the other day. I searched in light mode, and then the result came in. I don't know if you can see this. We can put a screenshot of the phone. But if you're an audio listener, the top part where it says Google on the search bar is the light mode. The bottom part with like your share and discover and search is light mode, but the middle results are all dark mode. It's weird. It was really strange. It's just, um, strange it's just like another weird thing that happens that you like that's noticeable. That's just something that feels like it's constantly going wrong. So I hope there's some bug fixes because I have a lot. Um, so do you or uh, do you have the download pending or no? I don't know. Did you also see? Um, I can check right now, but did you see how apparently some of these uh, 
some of the over the air updates for this were actually just putting people giving people Android 12 downloads like full 2 gig downloads to just put Android 12 on their phone when they already had Android 12. I thought that was fascinating. It very was odd. Very funny. <laughs> I we I did flash it like manually so mm-hmm. I didn't wait for the over the air update, but it worked out for me. Obviously that was a little more foolproof, but it wiped my phone. Um, I do not have the update right now, but um, now that you've used it for 24 hours, do you think it's worth doing the update right away, or do you th- would you recommend most people wait? No, I'd say update, okay. update. It's all it's because it's again, if it was like some huge thing, like a, a bunch of UI changes and a bunch of crazy features, and maybe some of them weren't stable yet, I would say wait. But this really is like Android 12.2. It's a lot of fixes and a lot of improvements. They moved the settings in the quick settings down. See, you know how it's typically right here in the middle. Yeah, they got it down there in the corner where it's oh, a little more reachable, a little power button down there. So. That's big. I think that's good. I think um, a lot of good changes. One last question on that. Do you think this could potentially be dropping it early to have more people using it and maybe get a couple bug fixes out of 13 before they launch it with Pixel 7? Because <laughs> the whole one of the big things that really hurt Pixel 6 was the bugs that came with Android 12 with that. Yeah, it is odd that it launched early. That mm-hmm. is an interesting theory. Uh, if it is their intent, I think it'll work because they now have a month of some early Pixel adopters and some bug reports to like really lock up Pixel yeah. 7's experience before it comes out and then go super hard with Pixel 7. Um, I can see that. Yeah. I, I, I think it's a really good idea, honestly. Not bad. You get that, and you get to just build a little bit of hype potentially a month or two before the release, and then yeah. they're not going to do an event showing it off. They're going to do it at the event anyways, so yeah. why not? build a little hype behind it. The clipboard stuff is cool. I think a lot of the features too, if you read up on Android 13, are tablet focused, and which basically keeps reminding me, oh yeah, right, they did announce that they're <laughs> gonna have a tablet that, yeah. coming out in like next year sometime, um, including universal copy and paste between the phone and, and the tablet, which already exists for some other phones, but it'll be built into Android, so that'll be cool. But yeah, whenever the Pixel tablet comes out, that'll have a whenever, bunch of cool features yeah. too. With the Roadster? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, did you see the, the couple people found out that on their Pixel 6a, you could unlock 90 hertz? Yeah, people were tweeting this at me. Well, because I, it, well, <laughs> first of all, okay, my big complaint, big complaint, I'm putting this in air quotes, I think the Pixel 6a is a really good phone. Mm-hmm. My biggest notable downfall of the Pixel 6a when you compare it to other phones in its price range is, well, this one's still 60 hertz, so while it is fast, it isn't as smooth yeah. because that high refresh rate helps it feel smoother. Um, a lot of people fired right back at me for that. How could you all, you know, 60 hertz is plenty. Yeah, obviously, lots of phones are 60 hertz still, but if you're going to be buying a new phone, most new phones for 500 ish dollars will give you a higher refresh rate. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's 90, sometimes it's 120. And as someone who has used a lot of phones, it's something I really think is worth getting at that price. So I'm, I noted that about Pixel 6a, but now with this headline, a lot of people were sending this at me because apparently this was a an intentional choice by Google, now knowing that the panel that they're using actually does support 90 hertz, potentially even 120 hertz. Um, it's confusing. So, so it's a nice flat 1080p OLED display that is capable of running theoretically at 90 hertz Mm -hmm. and refreshing at 90 hertz but google is locking everything with the pixel 6a at 60 hertz yeah Uh, from from everything i read is like there's and there's quite a few people who did this and it seems like a total pain in the neck if you actually want to do it is a very hacky way to do it yeah um but there are people who are getting 90 hertz out of their screens they're running multiple benchmarks to show that it's 90 hertz and showing videos and pictures of it which is also kind of hard to confirm but i think enough people have done it where it seems like it's totally believable that that this is happening but um it's so funny because it's like it's clearly not the same group of people but it is really funny hearing people get mad that i called out the 60 hertz on the pixel 6a and then theoretically a bunch of the same people are going but look it can do 90 hertz i thought I you thought didn't that didn't that matter much. to you. Yeah. I thought you didn't care about 90 hertz. Oh, you oh you do care about 90 hertz. Oh, okay, well, yeah. You can also buy a Pixel 6, by the way. <laughs> yeah. If you really want 90 hertz. Yeah, it, from everything that I read of what you have to do, it seems crazy hacky. It seems like it comes with a lot of problems. There's some people are, have like crazy green tint on it because the phone's then not calibrated for like the new, oh. the new uh, like how it's seeing the screen. And then also 
a lot of people were saying that they were doing it. And then when the, they would get the new option that says like smooth display, and then they would turn that on, the screen would just go black. Oh, so geez. I would like highly, highly not recommend yeah, doing no, this to no. your phone. Um, I think you need to be pretty like an kind of an expert or like pretty experienced to be able to do it, but it probably shouldn't be done. Um, I'm sure Google kept it at 90 for a reason. I don't 60. think they're sorry, 60 for a reason. I yeah. don't think they're trying to hide all that much from you. It probably just makes far oh, yeah. more sense. As I'm also pretty sure this won't be the first or last phone that has a display that is technically capable of a higher refresh rate that is locked at 60. I, I did see mention in here that apparently there was an Asus phone at one point that it was advertised as 120, but you could unlock it to 160, I think. Oh, wow. Well, um, I mean, sure. But yeah. Yeah. So my uh, my continued rampage against 60 hertz phones, including all of the iPhones that are super expensive and don't have higher fresh rate, will probably not end anytime soon. So fair, yeah. But it is kind of interesting seeing that this was an intentional choice. Uh, I will say this is one of the questions we have at the end. Like, if how many extra points would you give the Pixel Six? Say if it had a higher refresh rate out the box, I wonder how much it would affect you know, things like battery life mm -hmm. and overall efficiency of the phone. Google probably made that calculus already, which is why they landed yes. on what they decided to land on. But uh, yeah, we'll see what Pixel 7's lineup looks like. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very curious about that lineup. The pricing, the phones, the features that they launch with, how they follow up Pixel 6 with a Pixel 7 and a Pixel 7 Pro, and then waiting a few months, and then a theoretical Pixel 7a. What does that choice look like for Google? We'll see. But yeah, I think that's it. I'm still so hard in the, the group. I really think they should just release all three at the same time. I wouldn't be mad at all. But like I also the, the iPhone SE is like mid-cycle. The, yeah. uh, even the, the Nord for OnePlus is mid-cycle. Like they, they don't Yeah, but don't follow what OnePlus does. I would try and do the opposite of what, Plus, <laughs> that's fair. what OnePlus does. So. Totally fair. Okay. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. Trivia answers. I, I, I feel like there just could be a potential. I, I feel optimistic today which probably means I'll get everything wrong. All right, let's wrap up this beautiful day of trivia. All right, so question number one was, put the following Google products in chronological order. Mm -hmm. Google Pay, mm -hmm. Google Wallet, and Android Pay. Now, does it matter who goes first? Do we know? I kind of have my logic. I, I mean, I have one with, we are working on a, a different way of doing this. We will continue to do it how we are right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah. It'll take where we want to make it fun, but- um, I can talk through my logic okay. of what I think the answer is. Do you want me to just say mine off the top? If you want Because sure. I have no logic with okay. it. Okay, yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah. I reverse what you said. So pay, wallet, or Android pay, Google wallet, Google pay is my answer. I'm close, I think. Android Pay, this is hilarious because they're all so basically the same thing, but mm. Android Pay, I believe, was first because mm -hmm. there was uh, there was Apple Pay, there was Samsung Pay. I think that that's just the first thing that they called it. Okay. And I know that Google Wallet is the newest version that encompasses what used to be is it? the Pay service. So I think it's Android Pay, Google Pay, Google Wallet. No, isn't pay the new one? Wait, what's on my phone? I'm gonna check. <laughs> I, I phone looked right now, now, so I can't. This is too so I waited till after I gave my answer and looked. Uh, I guess I don't have it on my phone. What? You have a Pixel. Wait, yeah. Come down from the top. There we go. Where's my wallet? Is it wallet or pay? It doesn't show up. This is what Did I. Does it show up for you? This is what I have. What do you have? G Pay, Google hmm. Pay. So Google Pay. I'll accept G Pay and Google Pay as being the. Uh, okay. The well, and then it says welcome. Wait, to you Google have G Pay. Pay on your phone? It says G Pay, and then it's called. It says welcome to Google Pay. But my my Pixel says show access to wallet from lock screen. Oh, does it really? Yeah. What version oh. of Android are you on? Twelve. You're on twelve. Uh, oh wait, no, I have a wallet also. Wait. Okay. Now it. I'm oh, very no, confused. Yep. Right, I'm, I'm glad I went with, with no it. logic. I think my logic is the wallet includes Pay. Because um, pay is the service that you can use to like pay for Google Play services or like pay for Google subscriptions and things like that inside apps. 
And, and then, so the wallet includes Google Pay, but it also includes other cards. And gives you like the card so you can pay with yeah, like tap to pay. With tap to pay and things I like that. I think you're right on so that. So I think it's, I think and it's. Ju- judging by Elsa's reaction to seeing <laughs> I had Pay, I'm pretty sure you're right on that. Okay, too. so. Sure. Okay, so Marquez, you're you're really close. I think close enough for points. Uh, I'll take the points. So you're right. Uh, Android Pay came out in 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, then Google Pay came out uh, in 2018. And then they both got combined into Google Wallet in 2022. Yeah. The okay. part that you left out is that in 2011 Google put out a product called Google Wallet. Oh so there are God. two Google Wallets. Oh Google my. Wallet and Android Pay got merged into Google Pay in 2018 and then both of those got renamed to Google Wallet in this year. I remember David ranting about this at some point. This question took so long to research to find just the answer. Alo, wait, just duo me, so Alo and duo. Is the yeah. real answer to this? The real answer is Google Wallet, Wallet Android Pay, Google Pay, and then Google, and then Google Wallet, Wallet again. again. So you have, yeah. well, I have to use one twice. That's crazy. But I, I think, I feel like that's... I feel like you're close. I was like seventy five percent. Yeah, I feel like maybe maybe Adam will disagree, but he's not here, so I'm giving you. We points did it. We did a thing before where like the closest one would get the points. So I, I think you should you can get whatever. you should get the points. All right, All right but now I the real so. the real heater of now the, the question, real, the real tech question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Reconstituted discs of New Jersey breakfast pork are commonly and correctly referred to as. I'm gonna not get the points, but stand by Taylor well, Ham. I'm not, I'm not I res- get the points. I respect the decision. But I'm standing by it. It's pork roll. It is pork roll. Yeah. Incorrect. It's Taylor Ham. Sorry. That's- I go I, and I have enough <laughs> anecdotal evidence. There needs to be somewhat of an... Ex- can you explain a little bit? Because yeah, this is ultra everyone- regional. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I went to school in Hoboken and there is a really, really nice bagel shop on the corner of 7th and Washington, I believe, on my way to campus. Uh-huh. And anytime I went in there, I got a Taylor ham, egg, and cheese. And that's what it said on the board. And it's Hoboken and it's a bagel shop. And it's just like whatever they say. All right. So that's where I got it. And then I moved. And I also had a bagel shop near me when I moved. And they also, I guess I didn't ask for pork roll, but I, I got a Taylor ham, egg, and cheese every time. And uh-huh. they made it exactly how I wanted it. And that's just what I call it. Yeah. Yeah. To, to explain <laughs> if you didn't get what it was by reconstitute pork. <laughs> disc um it's yeah. like a it's a breakfast meat pretty it's much meat. similar to like canadian bacon a little fattier a little more processed i think it's um, like the hot dog of canadian it, bacon it's, yeah. if the hot dog was a breakfast disc that's what disc is it funny. is we love it in new jersey it's ultra regional like you can probably find it in philly and new york city but like yeah it's very very common in new jersey um and it is like there are two there are two arguments in new jersey and that is which we had during the break um, to say <laughs> for a very long time. This is going to be a long episode to edit, but is it Pork Roll or Taylor Ham? What is mm-hmm. the name of it? So Taylor Ham is the company mm-hmm. and Pork Roll is what it's called. Interesting. Um, and then it's, is there a central jersey or not? Which yeah. is like... Which is a funny... It's like we'll spare you that It's like Kleenex and tissue. It's like... Exactly. It's ba- all a tissue. Band-Aid and bandage. Yeah. yeah. But you better be eating Taylor Ham branded. North pork Jersey roll. calls it Taylor Ham. South Jersey calls it pork roll. That makes sense. Is generally the and Central Jersey calls it what? <laughs> <laughs> With that, thank you for tuning into Waveform yeah. this week. Uh, we appreciate everything. We'll catch you guys next week. Getting busy soon. Um, oh, it's real soon. It's real. It, it's like nervously soon. We're kind of already in it, actually. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Cool. See you next week. Waveform is produced by Adam Molina and Ellis Rovin. We are partnered with Vox Media Podcast Network and our intro outro music was created by Vane Sill.